All right, so thank you everyone for uh, attending, dialing in today. Uh, we have a very uh, packed, uh, exciting presentation later. Um, so as investors around the world uh, are looking to participate in the growing Chinese economy and the stock market, uh, there's still a general lack of um, in-depth fundamental research being done to allow private retail investors across the world to gain knowledge. So Chinese Alpha is a very specialized firm, one of the leading providers of these uh, in-depth research. And then I'll let uh, Lasik and Kevin to introduce the, the team there and then uh, get started with their presentation today. Yeah, thanks, James, for the quick introduction. Um, so also from my side, first of all, a big welcome. See, we have 25 people in the room. Uh, I'm sure uh, some more will join us in the coming minutes. Uh, it's nice to talk to everyone. Um, very quick intro to myself, since we have this uh, welcome slide up now, um, to uh, give you a bit more insights. And then I hope that uh, all of my colleagues um, who are with me in the calls, we have Kimo, we have Lasse, we have Kevin, um, will also give a quick introduction uh, as soon as it's uh, it's their time to to present during today's event all right so from my side um, i'm sitting in shanghai right now actually uh, so i'm in the heart of uh, the financial center in in china uh, just came out of my quarantine um, and originally obviously i'm not chinese i'm born in germany um, uh, studied business administration and started my career at a company called Rocket Internet. Uh, worked with a lot of startups during that time um, and transitioned into management consulting. Did that for a while before I started an accelerator in Berlin. I was working with extremely early stage startups um, and continued doing so uh, in Shanghai. So at some point I transitioned over to Shanghai um, and that was because I always had some kind of fascination for China. I always thought um, China is going to be extremely relevant um, in the near and midterm future. So um, for all of us, um, it makes sense to have as much China law knowledge as possible. So went over to China, uh, started leading an accelerator um, in Shanghai. What does that mean? Basically, we take startups, very early stage companies from outside of China, help them get into China, and we work with Chinese startups and help them scale in the Chinese market. Then what we also do is selectively, we um, participate in these startups um, and build a portfolio up like that. On the side, I also do a lot of angel investing, mainly focused on fintech, um, but also on things that touch the creator economy in the widest sense. So that is a very quick introduction. Now let's get back to um, today's topic, which is obviously we want to talk about um, China and we want to talk about Chinese equities. Um, we know that uh, in the most recent weeks, there has been a lot of regulation uh, in the Chinese market, literally billions of market cap have been wiped out um, in the Chinese stock markets. And now a couple of people come along and hold a presentation suggesting that some of you might maybe invest in Chinese equities. That seems a bit absurd, right? Um, we do think, nevertheless, there's big opportunities in the Chinese market. And you can go, um, you can go in two stages. The first stage is simply understanding what's going on in China, you know, learning from China, seeing what kind of business models, what kind of verticals work well here. In some industries, in some verticals, China is much further along than the West. So there's a lot we can just learn and almost copy, which was indeed a strategy that China applied, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, nowadays, in some verticals, they are much further along. So that's stage one, but stage two, of course, is if you're bold enough um, and if it fits your personal um, risk profile um, to also take advantage of um, stock market opportunities in China. And at Chinese Alpha, we believe that with good due diligence, you can uncover hidden gems 
in the Chinese equity market. Um, and we give our best with a great team of people ha that have experience on the ground in China, people that have experience researching equities, doing equity research um, to provide investment banking grade research for everyone who's interested. So um, I encourage all of you before we head into this presentation um, to check out our website, ChineseAlpha.com. There is a lot of free resources up there. So I'm sure everybody will be able to learn something. Of course, we also how we monetize ourselves is through a premium subscription. So for anyone who is a hardcore fan and thinks they want to really start investing in the Chinese market, there's a, a premium subscription where you get access to some of our knowledge, to some of our uh, equity research analysts that you'll be able to talk to directly, get investment advice and so on. Um, and lastly, we also have a great Telegram group uh, we're starting a YouTube channel, so we're very active out there. Um, and I would venture and say that we are the only um, platform out there providing this kind of deep research on Chinese small, mid-cap, and even large-cap stocks. Now, with that being said, I want to uh, give the word to my colleague, Kevin. Um, he'll give a short introduction about himself, too, and then start with the main part of the presentation and for me uh, i wish you all the best and uh, lots of fun and hit us up with a lot of questions in the q and a section afterwards hey thank you so much uh, kevin for you know the quick and detailed intro um so um hello my name is also kevin but uh people call me kevin francis so um Essentially, I act as the equity research lead here at Chinese Alpha, where I conduct research on small to mid cap Chinese companies, as well as in financial modeling, where um, primarily my um, background is in investment banking. So I was a former analyst at Citibank and JP Morgan in the APAC division, and also um, just a little bit of experience in the sales and trading department. Also, um, in my personal life, I actually come from a life science background. So I am an accredited biomedical scientist where I graduated at Imperial College London. And um, I've been an investor for a very long time. And I'm here based in the UK where I currently manage a, a personal portfolio, 330K, as well as doing some real estate flipping on the side. Um, so we're here to demystify Chinese equities for you, in which we believe is a good opportunity right now that it's in plain sight. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our agenda. So um, the first thing we'll be looking at is China from a macroeconomic lens. So looking at into the macroeconomic drivers behind China's uh, GDP rise. Also, I think quite relevant in 2021 is the regulatory and political concerns, as many of you have seen in the news. Also, I'm um, quickly looking into institutions and why they're beginning to invest in China. And uh, I think we'll give you some pretty surprising data uh, on this. And also um, how much China should be in your portfolio. So more of a qualitative, from a more of a qualitative point of view. And lastly, how to research Chinese stocks. And uh, we'll dive deep into all these topics, followed by a 20 minute Q&A in a Kahoot session. So uh, China from a macro lens is projected by many analysts to be the top economy to overtake the US by 2028. And that presents a potential opportunity to take advantage of short term mispricing as a result of the regulatory concerns in 2021. And uh, we'll just give you a quick rundown of these macroeconomic drivers. So um, quite interestingly, when we look over a 2000 year period, um, China and India has actually been the two predominant uh, economies in the world. And uh, actually, this is due to China and India having the two largest populations. So um, the larger the population, the larger the GDP growth. And uh, what happened in um, here is the Industrial Revolution. And uh, during the Industrial Revolution, this caused a decoupling of human capital and GDP growth, where machines became a primary driver for GDP. So um, in the same period, uh, you can actually see the USA 
becoming the very top economy in the world. However, over the last 40 years, we've begun to see a resurgence in China, where could this potentially signal a return to the average? So over the last uh, couple of years, China's market share has actually risen in terms of its GDP growth. Um, just, in terms of its GDP growth, and um, again, you know, it's carried, um, especially um, comparing it to the 1960s and to the 1970s, its share was around 2%, gradually between the 1990s and 2000, growing to 7.72%. And uh, over the last decade, it constituted about 65.28%, which is a whopping amount. And it just goes to show how much China is becoming more influential worldwide. And a lot of this is actually due to the tech rise. So um, if we compare the type of uh, top companies, the top 50, the top largest companies in um, the market, uh, most of them were financial uh, companies uh, with a few technology companies with being Tencent and Beidou. But if we compare it to December 31st of 2020, so 10 years later, we actually begin to see more um, technology companies such as Tencent and Alibaba, Mechuan, Pindudu, JD, and um, contemporary uh, contemporary um, technologies. So this isn't something that is actually um, just specific to China. We ha we've actually seen this also in, in the US, uh, for instance, the fang, fang stocks. And uh, with technology, um, especially over the five-year horizon, um, we've actually out the Chinese government has actually made technology a, a, a particular um, industry of interest. So um, according to their five-year plan, which uh, is announced in 2021, um, the government wants to increase R&D spending by at least 7% annually between uh, 2021 and 2025. Secondly, um, there's going to be a greater sh share of gross expenditure, especially in biotechnology and healthcare, from previously hovering around 5 to 6% to 8%. And thirdly, I think most importantly, also upgrading its manufacturing capacity um, and transforming uh, China into a manufacturing uh, superpower. And uh, the thing uh, to be, be um, noted about technology is its um, life cycle. So um, technology companies, in our opinion, tend to have very short business life cycles, simply because there are, there are lower barriers to entry. And also there's a lot of competition in the space, uh, meaning that technology companies can grow very quickly and um, and decline at the same time due to the same uh, issues in which uh, causes it to uh, rapidly grow. So in terms of the impact of the technology, um, China's labor costs actually enabled it to become the top manufacturing factory in the world. And again, off the back of these government policies and companies' entrepreneurial version, we actually view technology as the potential growth engine for China. And um, Importantly, um, the tech actually has um, effects on other industries such as manufacturing, uh, for instance, um, on e-mobility and also uh, right stemming from um, cost reduction in lithium ion batteries. And also um, because of policies orientated towards cleaner energy um, mentioned by Xi Jinping, this has driven a shift towards the electrification of transport. And also, according to Moore's law, the miniaturization of wireless chips, display, and batteries can continue to support the Chinese economy. And the reason to why manufacturing is so uh, important is because of this decline in um, a shifting age demographic in China. So not a lot of people um, actually, I don't think a lot of um, people in the market um, actually understand this, but in China, um, there's, a, there's an aging population, so the people aged between 2024 20, declining and an aging, there is an aging population. And because of this, um, it's actually causing a drag on the economy. And therefore um, it is essential for um, manufacturing industry to become more reliant on technology in order to ensure that GDP growth is uh, continuing to grow over a longer period of time. So um, the primary drivers behind China's tremendous growth is primarily due to a, a good labor force. Again, you know, labor productivity increasing from three to 15 hours, which um, again, it's not necessarily profitable for businesses to continue hiring. Hence why um, there's been a shift towards uh, technology and automation. 
Also, large-scale capital investment, again, from governments and foreign investment reforms, and that has funded a tremendous produ productivity growth. And lastly, and I think most importantly, because China joined the World Trade Organizations in 2001, this enabled China to um, increase its exports and directly impact the global economy. And again, in terms of future growth, we have four main drivers that we've identified. So the first is to promote free and fair competition through regulatory changes. That is something that I will touch upon uh, much later on. Also a mi middle class uh, demographic that is rising, again, uh, rising wages, uh, which actually leads towards a shift towards a consumer driven economy. And last of all, we see manufacturing as a mainstay. However, the difference is it won't be as capital intensive as technology begins to replace labor. And uh, here are six key industries in which the Chinese government has um, taken into consideration um, from biotechnology to high end manufacturing. So um, as many of you know, um, there have been a lot of regulatory concerns in 2021 as the companies began to expand at a very strong rate. And um, we're beginning to see because of this growth, um, we're sort of seeing a tussle between growth and um, in control, and that's something that I'd like to talk about. So, um, so the differences between regulations between US and China. In China, um, regulations tend to be a lot more decisive and quicker, where the Chinese government can change the competitive balance a lot more decisively than its democratic counterparts. And also a weak political opposition also results in more permanent changes so, go, so in, in more um, Western uh, societies, uh, government regulations tend to have, um, they have to run through a gauntlet of legal challenge before becoming law. In China, it doesn't have to run on so many legal challenges. Um, therefore, this results in permanent changes. So a lot of people ask, what is the end goal of the CCP? Is it growth or is it control? And uh, the tussle between this two actually explains much of the regulatory crackdowns in which we have seen on Chinese equities. So um, I think if you don't understand anything, I think um, business goals should must be fully state aligned um, if you don't remember any of this. So in terms of the regulatory consequences, um, we believe that all of this is due to China's leadership trying to aim for a period of qualitative growth. That is to ensure that growth is strategic and it's also aligned with their policies and because of these uncertainties this has created many mispriced opportunities in which to take advantage of and again you know 2021 the year of the regulations just a quick pun so how do these regulations actually affect business operations and uh, we've actually um shortly outlined it so for instance how uh, government acting as a buyer of products. So the green stuff is good for all these factors in the DCF and red is bad for all these factors in the DCF. So government as a buyer of products obviously increases revenue growth. However, you know, a antitrust or market share restrictions uh, will reduce the revenue growth over a, a period of time, which will result in a lower valuation. And also um, lending to companies that subsidize rates and restricting lending can also affect costs of debt. But this is something that um, we believe that you should look at in your own time and we'll be sharing this presentation in the Telegram group. So understanding uh, the Chinese uh, share types, uh, this is quite convoluted. So essentially there are two main categories, onshore uh, share types and offshore share types. So um, in terms of onshore, there are A shares and B shares. And these are typically traded on the Shanghai or Shenzhen um, stock exchanges. And for the A shares, it's kind of restricted to retail investors. However, um, some international investors, institutions can um, actually um, go through a special program in order to be able to invest. With B shares, on the other hand, um, they are open to foreign investors. However, they're not quite as popular because of their relatively small universe. And in terms of offshore, um, you have your Hong Kong, um, stocks, so eight shares, as well as in red, red chip um, stocks. So red chip stocks are slightly different because they are primarily state owned Chinese companies. And again, um, in terms of the regulatory environment, it might actually be smart to invest in these things because these businesses would have fully full alignment with the government policies. 
And also um, you have other shares such as uh, foreign listed US uh, Chinese stocks and also um, companies in the co companies trading on the Hong Kong uh, exchange that are incorporated uh, elsewhere, such as in the Cayman Islands. So um, you might ask why some of these companies are incorporated in the Cayman Islands. So um, this is actually uh, called a deep variable interest entity. And uh, this enables these companies to raise capital. And um, essentially these companies would typically be in sensitive areas in where government has restricted foreigners to own shares of the company. So in order to get around this, um, these businesses create a legal structure, um, which is typically an offshore shell company in the Cayman Islands. And these, this offshore shell company has a contractual agreement to be able to absorb profits from its onshore operating company. So what does that mean to you retail investors out there? So if you're investing in Alibaba, you're not, you're not investing in the operating company in mainland China. You are investing in the shell company that is based in the Cayman Islands. And because of that, um, unfortunately, retail investors don't have much of a say on how the operation is run. And if you want to challenge these contractual agreements, you can't go to the SEC. You must go to China and you must uh, challenge it in Chinese court, which uh, kind of sucks uh, for you and me. However, on a positive side, um, in order for these businesses to grow and uh, access foreign capital, uh, this is just one way to get around it. And it's just something that we all need to know. So um, we've actually got this from BlackRock. So um, why institutions invest in China? And according to them, um, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity, simply because of the exclusion of Chinese equities into global indices. And that represents investment flow, which is estimated to reach uh, 250 billion by the beginning of 2022. Also, it is a relatively under owned market where foreign ownership only accounts for 3% of the broad market. And also um, it's a meaningful source of diversification. So um, it has low covariance to um, develop markets, particularly for US investors. And also because the Chinese economy is uh, developing and maturing, um, it has a growing range of exposures and where 75% of GDP is now consumption related. And I think uh, this blows people, those, this will blow your mind. Um, so retail investors actually have quite a strong say in terms of the Chinese equities. So um, retail investors constitute 24% of total free float market capitalization. And uh, quite interestingly, um, trading volume in China, um, about 80% of retail investors contribute more than 80%. And that is much higher in the than in the US, which constitutes around 30 to 40%. So um, because of this, um, it's very important to understand how retail investors think. And um, retail investors actually think based on use sentiment, unfortunately. And if we plot an average um, in terms of the new sentiment, as well as the inflow from individual investors, we see a perfect correlation. However, when we actually compare the new sentiment to institutional investors, we see a negative correlation. Again, um, institutional investors trying to profit from new sentiment following um, retail investors. So how much China should be in your portfolio? And uh, again, this is purely from a hypothetical perspective from an average university student. So nothing too scientific. So again, why should you allocate China to your portfolio? One is that if you are a US investor primarily, it has a necessary diversification. Again, um, in China, it has, uh, these equities tend to have low covariance, meaning that you are diversifying away risk, systematic risk. Also, there's exposure to emerging markets. And uh, I think China is one of those countries that you just simply can't ignore simply because of how large the market is and especially where the country is heading in the next couple of years. Also, we believe that this is quite suitable for younger people uh, simply because younger people have a higher risk tolerance, meaning that despite these uh, equities being relatively volatile, um, you can profit from absolute returns in the long run. And um, from a purely hypothetical perspective, I think 35% should be allocated to China. 
with a staple being in US large caps, US small, US small caps, as well as in uh, Chinese, large, uh, Chinese large caps. So around 35% China. So my personal China allocation, so I have three main criteria in which I like to look for. And uh, again, this is quite uh, just simplified for the sake of this presentation. So the first is I, I, I'm a long-term investor. So I tend to look for medium and long-term compounders. I also prefer to be looking at business fundamentals. And um, one of my favorite quotes is being able to attach a story to a number. So especially if you're looking at uh, younger companies, for instance, its financial statements aren't going to be as great because they're not going to be cash flow positive. So it's always um, important to look at the quanti quantitative factors and how this relates to um, cash flow at the end of the day. And also I like to pay for a good price. So I always look for mispriced opportunities. And the key, um, the key wording is um, temporary but fixable problem. So um, a good business can only be a good investment at a good price. And um, if you are a beginner investor, um, one of my main recommendations is actually to invest in Tencent. So um, why Tencent? Tencent is actually um, the largest uh, Chinese company by market capitalization. And um, Tencent has been around for many, many years and it's highly diversified and compared to you know, the likes of Alibaba where it has a FinTech advertising and also a staple on gaming and social networking. So um, if you don't know um, about WeChat, WeChat is the fifth largest social media platform in the world. It serves around 1 billion Chinese users and currently um, serves 80% of Chinese um, consumers all around China. And on top of that, it's also beginning to expand into FinTech as well as in advertising. And um, if you want to have a good bet, then I think Tencent as a beginner investor um, is a good is a good um, is a good buy. So in terms of um, the 15 largest companies in China, more of a marketing gimmick really, but um, we do provide uh, free analyses for large caps, which are uploaded on a daily on a weekly basis. However, if you do want to have access to small and medi medium cap analyses, these are only available to premium users. And um, again, some price action from some stocks. And uh, as we can see um, from the last couple, from from the last year, due to the regulatory concerns, this has led to a decline in share price for many of these companies. And this could be a good opportunity for investors right now. So um, with many um, companies that are available to foreign investors, how do you actually research and select the right ones? So you can actually have two um, approaches. Um, you can have a small cap and a large cap approach. Uh, ideally, you should have a hybrid. Uh, if you don't notice, uh, this is actually a Yale cap right here. Um, so with small caps, again, um, these businesses are typically are more likely to be mispriced. And also they tend to generally are younger companies with a higher growth potential. So if you've got a higher risk tolerance, that maybe adding some small caps into your portfolio is a good idea. And on top of that, they typically have um, lower covariance due to lower beta. And that's very important for diversification benefits. And um, actually nine out of 10 uh, businesses um, that have been targeted by regular days are actually large caps. So um, if you want to own a business that isn't prone to regulatory changes, owning small caps is the way. On the other hand, um, if you are a large cap, if you want to buy large caps, again, they typically have lower volatility. They're also more prone to um, global economies because they typically are multinational. And also large cap companies tend to have higher ESG scores if that is important for you. And um, if you are a swing trader, for instance, uh, I would recommend large caps uh, simply because um, retail investors follow sentiment. And uh, if we actually look here in figure 21, um, over a 60 day period, um, if you rebalance over a long term, then you can get returns on average around six to 8% for large cap stocks. And uh, if you compare large caps to small caps, for instance, so um, you can see average sentiment being higher for these uh, companies. And also with the new sentiment scores, the sentiment tends to be a lot higher. And uh, the thing is, um, with trading that is very important to understand um, how retail investors are feeling simply because they constitute a lot of 80% of the trading volume uh, in Chinese equities. 
However, if you are more of a long-term orientated investor, we believe that uh, small caps uh, offer actually better qualitative, fact qualitative factors. So um, if we actually look here, um, the percentage of GDP for small cap companies constitutes 60%. Also, um, quite a lot of uh, patent, patents and innovations are small caps, and a lot of the product development that is occurring in China, as well as employment in urban areas are due to lot small cap companies. And uh, the main differences between small cap universe and the main China indexes is that there's a larger weighting to healthcare and information technology. Again, one could make the argument that these have very strong growth potential. And again, um, comparing small caps, they're relatively undervalued, even if you compare them to US uh, small caps. So for instance, if we look at the PE ratio, um, small caps tend to trade uh, around 9.9x. And if you compare this to US small caps, which is in around 20.2%, and uh, again, to the main all shares China uh, index, which is 16.4%. So clearly, you know, these companies are trading at a discount. And um, in terms of its growth and earnings, uh, China's small caps actually outperform uh, the US and also outperform uh, slightly to the main indices. So how do you go about um, researching Chinese stocks? Um, so the first thing I would do is I would go through a screening procedure. And I know that a lot of you have access to Capital IQ. And uh, again, you should only um, look for companies that have very strong uh, fundamentals uh, very strong qualitative factors in which uh, relate to telling a good story as well as relating that story to a good valuation. Also, it's very important as an investor to be able to understand its business model. So I'm um, going through its annual reports, investor relations documents, analyst calls, and any proxies of any, and you should also repeat for any of the competitors. And uh, the difference between us and many other research institutions is that we actually have an internal skeleton. And uh, we use this to assess qualitative factors that are very difficult to quantify. So for instance, the business model, um, where it's going, um, the market size, there's also its positioning as well, and also risk severity and various probabilities. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail into this because it will take 20 minutes, but we're more than happy to take uh, questions later um, later down the line. And also um, another unique thing that we like to do is we like to set, select local and global proxies, and that is to forecast the company's industry. And uh, we like to use Data Yes or Statista. Um, again, you know, this is something that I'll expand on in the next slide. And um, it's also very important because um, a lot of companies depend on the macroeconomics. Um, it's also um, very important to look into things like interest rates and unemployment. So if you've got access to the Bloomberg terminal, or if you're a retail investor and you want to get free information, then use Coifin by any means. And lastly, it's important to always do a DCF and forecast these financial statements. Uh, again, if you don't know how to do DCF, um, Finbox is a great resource for you guys. So in terms of uh, these data proxies, what we were referring to, um, so this is basically the use of alternative data and that is to forecast said industries. And the reason to why we do this is because this kind of information is less likely to be manipulated. And also um, based on uh, several studies, they also have a good predictive power. So if you want to look at, for instance, company, uh, you want to look at employment metrics, for instance, then a good global source would be something like LinkedIn. But for anything specific to China, maybe looking at LiPin or 51 jobs, to be able to use this as a proxy for employment growth. Also, if you want to maybe change, uh, look into consumer trends, for instance, uh, you can, um, as a global source, you might use, um, again, you know, your typical social media, but in local sources, you might want to use WeChat, Weibo, and Dujin. And uh, lastly, um, if you want to look into investor uh, sentiment, again, very important as retail investors constitute a lot of the trading volume Using a local source like Goober, which is equivalent to the Wall Street bets, is a, a, a good um, is a good thing. So in terms of our databases, we have um, four main main ones. So we have Data Yes, which is basically an alternative data platform. It's something that um, we um, exclusively have access to. Although some investment banks 
in mainland China do have access to them. However, in comparison to other um, institutions here in the US, for instance, or in Europe, um, we're probably one of the few people that to have access to this. Also, obviously, capital IQ and Thomson Econ readers. And lastly, we like to use Statista. In terms of our news sources, um, we actually have a media bias chart. So I know in the US, um, Fox News and CNN, they can offer political commentary, but that's not something that we, we quite like, simply because we don't want to have colored in information. So um, we'd actually have a, a bias towards more objective news sources, such as Associate Press or Reuters. So in terms of our, our takeaway and uh, Q&A, um, you get a takeaway and Q&A. Uh, China offers fundamental investment opportunities, especially for those people looking for diversification. And again, we view a lot of these regulatory actions in 2021 as a necessary problem for future growth. And with quality research, we believe it's possible to navigate the Chinese market and outperform in the long term. And again, I'm going to pass the mic on to Lasse, and uh, he can now do the Kahoot. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> So also from my side again, hello everybody. I think it was shortly introduced at the beginning, but let me do it again. So I'm Lasse Radke. Um, I'm a founding member of Chinese Alpha. And myself, I've been in the venture building space for two years now about that. And um, I'm located in Munich. So, you know, exactly where the beer is so good. <laughs> so if anybody ever happens to be in Munich sometime, uh, you know, just send me a message on LinkedIn or something, we can grab a beer or something. Um, but, you know, this is now the team, an overview about our founding team and the equity research analysts. There are some people also, you know, for example, the marketing team, but those are, you know, the guys who, who write the analyses. That's quite important. You know, below you can see the QR code of our LinkedIn accounts. Um, you know, make sure to, to you know, uh, scan that if you're interested in connecting to us. Uh, Jason Richter on the right, he's not here today. He's basically based in uh, Massachusetts right now. Um, he's been working at JP Morgan for three years now in Moderna. Um, you know, just as an introduction, he's not here today, but the rest is. So, you know, grab your phones or something and scan the QR code if you want, or just type in our names on LinkedIn. Um, you know, happy to connect with you and talk about anything. Or, you know, grab the beer Munich any anytime. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, the, the last slide now in a second will be around how you can follow us follow what's going on in China. So basically on the right, this is our Telegram group, uh, how you can join. So basically, basically this is a, a group with global people who are interested in China, exchanging opinions. Our team also supports with um, news, what's going on, our opinions. We answer lots of questions. Um, and this is, you know, quite interactive community we're building on Telegram right now. So, you know, if you're interested in that on the right, that's your QR code. On the left, quickly, you know, if you're interested actually in joining our team sometime, um, interning with us, uh, on the left are the application uh, deadlines, um, you know, just to write down if you're interested in that. That's how you can really get into our team, possibly. And below that is a QR code for our uh, LinkedIn account or company page. 